welcome to theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier here, joined by Platform 9, Amelia Abel, the Chief Revenue Officer, really digging into the conversation around Kubernetes cloud native and the journey of this next generation cloud. Amelia, thanks for coming in and joining Thank me today. You. Thank you, great pleasure to be here. So CRO, Chief Revenue Officer, so mm -hmm. you're mainly in charge of serving the customers, making sure they're, they're happy with the solution you guys have. That's uh, right. And this market must be pretty exciting. Oh, it's very exciting and we're seeing a lot of new use cases coming up all the time. Um, so part of my job is to obtain new customers, but then of course service our existing customers and there's a constant evolution. Nothing is standing still right now. We've so. had all your co-founders on, on the show here. and We've kind of talked about the, the trends and where you guys have come from, where you guys are going now. And it's interesting, if you look at the cloud native market, the scale is still huge. You're seeing yeah. now this next wave of AI coming on, which right. I call, that's the real web three in my mind in terms of like the next experiences really still points to data infrastructure, scale. These next gen apps are coming. Mm -hmm. And so that's being built on the previous generation of DevSecOps. Right. And so a lot of enterprises are having to grow up really, really fast right. to figure out, okay, I got to have scale. I got large scale data. I got horizontal scalability. I got to apply machine learning now, the new software engineering practice. And then, oh, by the way, I got the Kubernetes clusters, I got to manage, and I got right. all these containers, where the security problems. This is a really complicated but important area of build out right now in right. the marketplace. What are you seeing? So it's, it's really important that um, the infrastructure is not the hindrance in these cases. And we, one of our customers is in fact a large AI company. Um, and we I met with them yesterday and asked them, you know, why are you uh, giving that to us? You've got really smart engineers. Uh, they can run and create the infrastructure you know, in a custom way that you want it. And they said, we've got to be core to our business. There's plenty of work to do just on delivering the AI capabilities and there's plenty of work to do. We can't get bogged down in the infrastructure. We don't want to have people running the engine. We want them driving the car. We want them creating value on top of that. So um, they can't have the infrastructure being the bottleneck for them. It's interesting, the AI companies, that's their value proposition to their customers is that they don't want the technical talent right. working on you know, non-differentiated heavy lifting things. Right. And automate those and scale it up. Can you talk about the problem that you guys are solving? Because there's a lot going on here. Yeah. You can look at all aspects of the DevOps scale. There's a lot of little problems, some big problems. What do you guys focus in? What's the bullseye for Platform 9? Okay, so the bullseye is that Kubernetes infrastructure is really hard, right? It's really hard to uh, create and run. Um, so we introduce a time to market efficiency. Let's get this up and running and let's get you into production and, and producing results for your customers fast. But at the same time, let's reduce your cost and complexity and increase reliability. So and what are some of the things that they're having problems with that are breaking? Is it more of updates on code? Is it size of the I mean, clusters they have? What, what, is it more operational? What are, the, what are some of the things that are that kind of get them to call you guys up? What's it's the, the operations, thing? it's all operations. Um, so what, what happens is that if you have a look at a Kubernetes platform, it's made up of many, many components. And that's where it gets complex. It's not just Kubernetes. There's load balancers, there's networking, there's observability. All these things have to operate together and all the piece parts have to be upgraded and maintained. The integrations need to work. You need to have probes into the system to predict where problems can be coming. So the operational part of it is complex. So you need to be observing not only your clusters and the health of the clusters and the nodes and so on, but the health of the yeah. platform itself. We're going to get Peter Frey in on here after uh, on talk about some of the technical issues on deployments. But what's the what's the big decision for the customer? Because there's kind of there's two schools of thought. One is I'm going to build my own mm -hmm. and have my team build it, or I'm going to go with a partner. Right. Say Platform Nine. What's the trade-offs there? Because it seems to me that that there's a there's a certain area of where it's core competency, but I can outsource it or partner with it and, and work with Platform 9 versus trying to take it all on internally, right. of which requires more cost. So there's, right. a, there's a line where you kind of like figure out that, customers have to figure out that that piece. Right. What do you, what's your view on that? Because I'm hearing that more people are saying, hey, I want to I focus my people on solutions, uh -huh. the app side, 
not so much the ops. Right. What's the trade-off? How do you guys it, talk It's about a really it? interesting question because most companies think they have two options. It's either a DIY option, and they love that. Engineers love playing with the new and the latest. And then they think the other option is going to cloud, public cloud, and have it semi-managed by them. And you get very different um, out of those. So in the DIY, uh, you get flexibility because you get to choose your infrastructure. Um, but then you've got all the complexities of the DIY piece. You've got to not only choose all your components, but you've got to keep them working. Now, if you go to um, public cloud option, uh, you lose flexibility because a lot of those choices are made for you, but you gain agility. Because quite frankly, it's really easy to spin up clusters. Um, so what we are is that in the middle, we bring the agility um, and the flexibility because we bring the control plane that allows you to spin up um, clusters and, and lifecycle manage them very quickly. So the agility is there, but you can do it on the infrastructure of your choice. And in the DIY culture, one of the hardest things to do actually is to convince them they don't have to do it themselves. They can focus on higher value activities, which are more focused on delivering outcomes to their customers. So you provide the solution that allows them to feel like they're building it themselves. Correct. And get the scale and speed and the efficiencies of the ops side. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's not a full right. outsource. Right. You're bringing them in to make their jobs easier. Right, that's right. So they get choices. Yeah. Uh, we, we um, they get choices on how they build it uh, and then we run and operate it for them. Um, but they, they have all the observability. The benefit is that if we are um, managing their operations and most of our customers choose the managed operations piece of it, then um, they don't, we, if something goes wrong, we fix that and they, they, they get told, oh, by the way, you had a problem, we've dealt with it. <laughs> but in the other model is they've got to create all that observability themselves and they've got to get ahead of the issues themselves and then they've got to raise tickets to whoever they need to raise tickets to, whereas we have things like auto ticket generation and so on where, look, just drive the car, let us worry about the engine and all of that, let us deal with that, and you can choose whatever you want about the engine, but let us manage it for you, so. What do you, what do you say to folks out there that are, may have a need for Platform 9? What's the signals inside their company that they should be um, calling you guys up and, and leaning in with Platform 9? Right. Is it more sprawl on, on clusters? Is it more, errors, is it more tickets, is it more hassle? What are some of the signs if someone's watching this and saying, hey, I have, I have an issue with this? Uh, I would say if there's operational inefficiencies, um, you can't get uh, things to market fast enough uh, because you're building this and it's just taking too long. You're spending way too much time operationally on the infrastructure, then you're, you're not using your resources where they should best be used and, th and that is delivering services to the customer. Edmund Hora on for International Women's Day and she was talking about how they love to solve complex problems on the engineering team at Platform 9. It's going to get pretty complex with the edge emerging Indeed. and then cloud native on-premises distributed computing Indeed. essentially is what it is. That's kind of the core DNA of the team. Yeah. What, how does that translate to the customers? Because IT seems to be, okay, I have virtual machines were great. Now I got to scale up and, and convert over or transform to containers, Kubernetes, right. and then large scale. Uh, app, mm -hmm. app applications. Right, so when it comes to edge, it gets complex pretty fast because it's highly distributed. So how do you have standardization and governance across all the different edge locations? So what we um, bring into play is an ability to, um, at each edge location, uh, provision from bare metal up all the way up to the application. So let's say you um, have um, thousands of stores and you want to uh, modernize those stores. Um, you know, rather than having a server being sent somewhere to have an image loaded up and then sent that, and then you've got to send a technical guy to the store and you've got to implement it all there, forget all that. That's just that's just a ridiculous waste of time. So th what we've done is we've created the ability where the server can just be sent to the store. You can get your barista or your chef just to plug it in, right? You don't need to send any technical person over there. As long as we have access to it, we get access to it and we provision the whole thing from bare metal up and then we can maintain it according to the standards that are needed and upgrade accordingly. And that gives standardization across 
all your stores or edge locations or 5G towers or whatever it is, distribution centers, and we can create nice governance and um, good standardization, which allows them to innovate fast as well. So this is a real opportunity for you guys. This yeah. is an advantage from your expertise. Yes. The edge piece, dropping in a box, uh -huh. self-provisioning. That's right. So uh, Can yeah, people do that. What's the no? Actually, it's it's very difficult to do. I I from my understanding, we're the only people that can provision it from bare metal up, right? Um, so if anyone has a different story, I'd love <laughs> to hear about that. But that's my understanding today. That's good value yeah. proposition. Let's talk about the value of the customer. What kind of scope do you guys? Can you scope some of the customer environments you have from, sure. from you know, small to the large? How? Give us an idea of the okay. order of magnitude of the. Customer. Yeah. So so um, small customers may have twenty clusters or something like that, 20 nodes, I beg your pardon. Um, our large customers, like we're, we're scaling one particular distributed environment from uh, 2,200 nodes to 10,000 nodes by the end of this year and 26,000 nodes next year. We have another customer that's um, scaling up to 10,000 nodes this year as well. So we have some very large mm -hmm. scale, but some smaller ones mm -hmm. too. And we're, we're happy to work with either end. Okay, so pretend I'm a customer. I'm really, I got pain. Kubernetes, like I want to, I can't hire enough people. I want to have my right. people focused. What's the pitch? Okay, so skill shortage is something that that everyone is facing right now, and um, uh, if if you've got skill shortage, it's going to be really hard to hire um, if you're competing against really you know high salary you know, offering companies that are out there. So the pitch is, let us do it for you. We have um, we have a team of excellent, probably the best Kubernetes engineers on the planet. Um, we will create your environment for you. We will get it up and running. We will allow you to, um, you know, uh, run your application, just consume the platform. We'll run it for you. We'll have SLAs and uptimes guaranteed and you can just focus on delivering uh, the software and the value needed to your customers. What are some of the testimonials that you get from people just anecdotally? What do they say? Oh my God, you guys saved yeah. our, our butts. Uh, yeah. God, this is amazing. We just shipped our code out much faster. Yeah. What are some of the things that you hear? Uh, so, so the number one thing I hear is it just works. Right, it's uh, we don't have to worry about it. It just works. So that that's a really great um, feedback that we get. Um, the other thing I hear is if we do have issues, that your team are amazing. Um, they they fix things. They're proactive. Um, you know, they we really enjoy working with you. So from from that perspective, that's great. But the other side of it is we hear things like if we were to do that ourselves, we would have taken six to twelve months to build that, and you guys have just saved us six to twelve months. Um, the other thing that we hear is with the same two engineers we started on, you know, a hundred nodes, we're now running thousands of nodes. We have not had to increase the size of the team and expand and scale exponentially. Awesome, what's next for you guys? What's on your, your plate? Yeah. CRO, what's some of the goals you have? Yeah, so growth, of course, as a CRO, you don't get away from that. Um, we've got some very exciting, uh, actually, initiatives coming up. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of uh, demand for and um, is, is in the area of virtualization, bringing virtual uh, machine, virtual uh virtual containers, sorry, I'm saying that all wrong, <laughs> bringing uh, the virtual machines onto the cloud native infrastructure using KubeVirt technology. Um, so that provides a, an excellent stepping stone for those guys who are in the virtualization world and they can't move to containers, they can't refactor their uh, applications and workloads fast enough. So just bring your virtual machine and put it onto the container infrastructure. So we're seeing a lot of demand for that uh, because it provides provides an excellent uh, stepping stone. Why not use Kubernetes uh, to orchestrate virtual uh, the virtual world. Um, and then we've got some really interesting cost uh, optimization. So a lot of migration solutions. kind of thinking around VMs and Oh, and tremendous. The, the VM world is just massively bigger than the container world right now. Um, so you can't ignore that. So we're providing um, a, basically the evolution, the, mm -hmm. the journey for the customers to utilize the greatest of technologies without having to do that in a, in, a, in a way that just breaks the bank and they can't get there fast enough. So we provide those stepping stones for them. 
Uh, yeah. Delia, thank you for coming on thank sharing you. the update on Platform 9. Congratulations on your big accounts you have. Thank and, you. And the world's going to get more complex, which means Indeed, you have more yeah. customers. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. I'm John Furrier. You're watching Platform 9 and the Cube Conversations here. Thanks for watching.